Stephanie Page Thompson. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. I've been wanting to interview you for a while because I love your work. You're an amazing painter and you're freaking young. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really curious about your history. And I mean, I've got lots of questions for you, but let's start with that. Um, how old are you, first of all? I am 24. Yeah, just a baby. And I met you when you were like <laughs> 17, I think, or how, how old were yeah. you? I think we met at Portrait Society. We Is did. that correct? Yeah. I would thought that was the same. I'm pretty sure I just shoved you my um, portfolio after a session that you did on composition. That's I'm pretty sure how we met. Um, I think so. Yeah. yeah, I was I was 17. I'm pretty sure I was 17 or 18, depending if it was the first or second year. I don't remember. Yeah, which is mind blowing because even then you were really good. But now you're doing some unbelievably beautiful work. And Thank so you. tell me a little bit about just a little bit, because I know you've had other podcasts. Um, but tell me just a little bit about your history and how you were educated. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, so I graduated high school when I was 17 and I was homeschooled all the way through my whole um, educational career, you could say. And I always had been artistic, but had never thought I would actually pursue a career in the arts. Um, so when I graduated, I realized that, you know, I didn't want to be a dental hygienist and I didn't want to do all these other things actually. And that I would, I was curious about actually learning how to draw and paint well. And um, my parents were very supportive of that right from the start. And I was very blessed to have um, wise counsel from some art teachers in my childhood who said, don't go the traditional art school route. Um, don't go to the art school that's right in your town. Uh, you're going to spend so much time doing basket weaving, etc. And you don't want a basket weave, you want to paint. So that was very helpful. So I, I found workshops through the, the, the suggestion of this art teacher I had as a young child who did um, art lessons for kids named Barry Stebbing. And he said, you should find um, particularly C.W. Mundy. Um, so I grew up in the Indianapolis area and C.W. has lived in Indianapolis for uh, a very long time. I don't know, at least 25 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I tried to find his workshop and couldn't get in, but I was able to take a different workshop. And so the way I have been educated um, has been through workshops all over the country. And I've tried, I tried to be in your workshop in I think 2018 and it, it ended up not working out. So I've never actually gotten to study with you for real, but. Oh, okay. I'm flattered that you even tried. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> so you learned everything that you know about painting from workshops, just one week lessons compiled yes. on top of each other. Yes. So when I started taking workshops, I took my first one and I, I couldn't get into CW's workshop, but what was happening was there was a whole group of workshops all happening in one place. And so I took a workshop with someone else and happened to be able to meet CW during that week because all the artists and teachers were milling around together. And he, I was able to connect with him and he was so gracious to mentor me essentially. And so I was able to go to his studio a couple of weeks later and I had all of these um, studies I'd been doing. I'd been painting portraits with an art teacher locally named Charlene Brown. We were painting, um, first I was doing master studies of portraits and then I was taking photos of faces and painting them myself. And then I was painting from life. So it was kind of like this step by step process to prepare me for painting from life, mm -hmm. portraits from life. And so I had all of these nine by 12 portraits. And so I took all of them. My mom and I went um, to CW's studio and he gave me the advice to keep painting, first of all, which was nice, and that I should go to Scottsdale, Arizona and Scottsdale Artist School specifically and study for as long as I could there. So he said, it's going to take you a long time to get out there. So 
once you're out there, I think you should stay for two weeks and take two back-to-back -back workshops. And I will look at the workshop schedule and let you know what I think would be best for you. And so one of the workshops I took when I, w when I went for two weeks to Scottsdale was with a woman named Johanna Harmon. She's out of Colorado and she learned exclusively or primarily through workshops as well and has um, been a professional artist for many years. So that was part of the impetus. CW said other people are doing this, learning only through workshops. She's an amazing painter and she's done what you want to do. So you should go and learn from her and ask her as many things as you can come up with to find out how she managed to do this. So there was a precedent um, in her example. I knew it was possible to be able to learn through workshops. And um, I'm really thankful that even though it was only one week, I've been able, each time I took a workshop, I've been able to have lasting relationships with most of the painters that I have studied with and carry on communication. So even though I was only physically with them for roughly five days, I've been able to stay in touch and still gain um, wisdom. Wow. And be friends. That's unbelievable. Yeah. So why didn't you do what a lot of artists are doing today and do the atelier route? That is such a, um, that was an all encompassing absorbing question for me for those first two years, probably. I, so I started when I was 17 and when in that first year I took three workshops and I was also taking both painting and drawing classes locally with Charlene Brown, who I told you I mentioned earlier. And um, I went to Portrait Society that first year. So it was just like saturation bombing that first year. And, you know, some people were looking at my work and counseling that I needed to go to New York or needed to go to Philadelphia or, you know, all these different ateliers. And I wasn't certain that that was going to be right for me. And I was asking all these different painters. So that was part of the process also. I was, so what I was, was I'm just curious, what, what, what was it that they did or didn't have, or that workshops did or didn't have that made you lean in that direction? Could you, when you say it's not right for you, what specifically made it not right for you? And I'm not looking for criticisms of anything. I'm looking for kind of how your mind works and what your strengths and weaknesses are and why you felt like workshops were better than that. That's all I'm looking for. Yeah, no, I understand that. Um, for me to do the atelier route, I would have had to go into debt. Ah. And I didn't want to do that because I wanted to, I just didn't want to go into debt. I've yeah. never been in debt and I never wanted to be. So that was a huge issue for me that I needed to know if it was right. And I was studying with many people whose art I really wanted to emulate. And most of them hadn't gone to ateliers. And so it was just a mixture. You know, I had some right. people telling me yes, some people telling me no. And the type of art that I wanted to create, I thought I could achieve that goal by studying through workshops and I wouldn't have to go into debt for workshops mm -hmm. and because I could space them out as appropriately as I could um, pay for them. Right. I also had the support of my parents, but um, I would have still had to go into debt for uh, an Italian okay. training. That's so no small it was thing. sort of the combination of the the financial side and then the locations of where most of the ateliers were was um, also kind of unattainable. Mm. So just not places I really wanted to, I didn't think it would be good for me just as a whole person. It, right. it probably would have been good for me. It would have been an amazing teaching, but I didn't think for my whole person it was going to be beneficial in the long run. So, and then with the advice of all these painters who I was studying with, um, some of them looked straight at me and said, don't do it. Just don't do it because you're already doing things that um, are things you wouldn't, they wouldn't have you doing until year three, what have you. So that was, that was sort of a many mm. different, many uh, different reasons for why I chose not to do that. Yeah, that's so interesting. And I think you probably made, I'm, no, I don't think you probably, you obviously made the right decision because you've had a lot of success with that route. Thank you. But one thing I'm, okay, I'm going to be like, 
super dad mode here, but I'd like to meet your parents <laughs> because I, <laughs> because your, your level of wisdom for a 17 year old to be considering debt and to be considering your whole person and the environment you're going into aside from your education, that's kind of, those are uh, decisions that are difficult and that people twice your age uh, usually choose incorrectly, <laughs> you know? So congrats to uh, considering bigger issues on that. I'm very thankful for my parents. They yeah. are um, incredible. You've met my mom. That's right, I did. you probably I don't did. remember because you meet a million people. Um, and my dad has never really gotten to be part of, he comes to openings and things, but he hears about all these artists and hasn't really gotten to meet any uh, peers and teachers and things, but they're very, they were very supportive and they were very, they were very helpful to me. They never said, no, you can't do an atelier, you know, in my, right. my, you know, my human spirit, I could have then been like, well, that is a hundred percent what I'm going to do. <laughs> right. But they were like, we're gonna, we're gonna support you. But this is a big issue more than just if you can draw a likeness. So how are we gonna figure this out for you? Yeah. So what do you I mean, I don't want to give all credit to your parents, because I look at my um, children, and I'm like, and they have things that I certainly didn't give them. So <laughs> what do you attribute your approach to life to? I mean, you've already given your parents some credit, but is there anything else? I would say the way that my parents raised me has been fundamental in the way that I have approached life. I was raised um, in the Christian church and my faith in the Lord is extremely, is the most important thing in my life, um, to my life, even more than painting. So that was, it has always influenced um, what decisions I would make. Hmm. And there's been a couple of things. So that is the foundation. You know, I have a foundation of, um, a, you know, truth to build on. And I'm not looking for that in, uh, you know, painting right. or um, anywhere else. That has that would I would say is a very incredible and unspeakable um, influence on my life. So your original question being, how did I come out doing this? I mean, one thing that's kind of interesting that has influenced just how I um, approach life is this journey of falconry that I started when I, before I was even a painter, when I was mm -hmm. 16, I started the sport of falconry and basically how that works. It's the hunting and catching a prey with a wild bird of prey. Mm -hmm. So where I live, I had a red tailed hawk and you have to do all of this studying. You have to have a great outlay of financial resources and physical labor to purchase all the equipment and build all the uh, equipment that the birds need to live in before you ever have the reward of is holding a bird or reaping the benefit of training it and having it succeed. So it is sort of this um, foundational um, preparation, I would say, for being an artist where you have this vision out here, but your ability is out here, down here, and you have to bridge that gap. Mm -hmm. And there's often no reward <laughs> or it's painful or it's slow and you don't see the end. And then all of a sudden you, not all of a sudden, but you do reach the end and it is so worth it. So I would say all of those things combined have prepared me to um, pursue painting. Hmm. That's really it. So are you doing falconry still? So I don't have a bird right now. For the first time in seven years since I started, I have not had a bird this last year because I um, got married in March of 2021 and then moved to Boston uh, with my husband and Boston apartments are not super friendly to red tail hawks. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't think so. I'm not in Boston anymore. So I'm hoping to have one um, this fall. Oh, that'd be amazing. So yeah. um, you referred to the red tail hawk as a wild bird, though. So, but obviously it's in captivity. Do you, yes. I mean, you, you still treat it as a wild animal, even though you've trained it to hunt and so on and so forth? Well, you trap them from the wild. So oh, okay. 
you get them when they're under a year old, but they are fully grown. And you can all, when they're trapped from the wild that way, you can always release them back into the wild because they're never fully tamed because mm. they were raised by their parents. So if you, there's certain birds that you can breed and then, you know, buy or sell. And those bird, um, those birds are called imprints um, because they would view humans as peers. So they cannot be released into the wild because they don't identify with, um, which is kind of a funny way to put it, but they, they would have no fear of humans. They would fly down on picnic tables. They might not survive. So, mm. um, with the, with a red tailed hawk, you trap them from the wild and then you can always, um, return them back to the wild. Wow. That's really cool. My son is going to yeah. love this one. Cause he's a huge animal <laughs> fan, <laughs> huge animal fan. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I am too. That's really cool. So I wanted to point out one thing that I've observed about you that I think would be really useful to people listening to this podcast that I don't know if you realize how much likely helped you in your career. And that is your, um, your personality is you're very upfront. You're not shy at all. You're, you're, you, you strike me as a type A personality in that you go, you seem to go after what you want. You yep. know, where, when I go to the Porch Society and typically when you, or not so much even the Porch Society, but just in general, when you're around people that are 17 years old that want to be artists, they're usually like hiding behind their parents, you know, <laughs> kind of, kind of intimidated, kind of shy, kind of not, un, not really comfortable in their surroundings, but you just. I remember meeting you and you were just like one of us. You just came up to me and talked to me like a peer. I mean, you were very respectful and kind, but you, I mean, you're just okay, very good. confident. I, like, oh, no, no, no. No. I mean that in a good way. I mean, you were, you were very respectful, but you um, probably gave me more respect than I deserved. But, <laughs> but my point is you, you, you had this humility and yet confidence about you that I think is really important in becoming an artist. Um, well, thank you. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, I, th do you think that's I been helpful that. to you as you've gone through this path? Um, I do. It's, it's really fascinating because I don't understand, um, completely why I, I feel like it's a blessing, um, that I was blessed with the understanding of what I really have wanted to do with my life from such a young age. I think there's a lot of people that, um, don't know that, which is, um, I'll, it's totally fine. I just, when I took that first workshop, I had this feeling that I thought maybe I wanted to be an artist. I'd always been the best artist in my circles, my family, you know, it was always sort of easy for me, but I couldn't draw. I couldn't get a likeness and, but I was drawing all the time. Um, but I, I didn't really know actually how to draw. And I'd started oil painting when I was 14 and I loved painting, but I couldn't, I hated painting anything from life or, or even from photos. So I was just painting master studies all so the why time. Did you hate I painting painting from so life? Good. Why did you hate painting from life and photos? Because I, from life, it was just so hard and I, I didn't understand value at all. Mm -hmm. So I was always confused why nothing looked lit. And mm. I remember having my whole French easel set up in my backyard in my z family zinnia garden. We would always grow all these zinnias right. every summer. And I, you know, I just would be out there walking and think, oh, I'm an artist. This is so beautiful. I'm going to come paint this. And then every time I would try, I would just be so angry because I didn't understand how to handle all of the leaves, all of the petals, all of the background. How do mm. I simplify and I ended up just every single time thinking, well, it's just way better just to be an artist and think about painting than actually come paint because it's super hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. But when I would copy paintings, I understood how to, you know, take it through the process or I just, the copies were not something that you'd think, oh my gosh, it's like a forgery. It's so good. But they looked like the... um the paintings I was copying and, and it made me feel good, you know? And so I did them 
and I didn't like painting from life because it was hard and I wasn't good at it. So when I got into that first workshop, I had this whole basis of thinking, you know, this will be right up my alley because I'm always kind of just good at these things. And I got into the workshop and there were many professional painters in the workshop and it was a landscape workshop. And he started talking about composition, color temperature, value, and um, mark making, all of these things that I had absolutely no idea that what they meant. You know, I had no idea what value was, let alone color temperature. Hmm. And everyone else seemed to be getting it. And I was just so um, crushed in a way because I had gone in there all like, woo, I am the bee's knees, you know, like I'm yeah. going to be great at this. And I wasn't great at it. And but I was I was also just gripped by the desire to be great at it. And I remember him just talking about these things and so and thinking, OK, I have no idea what he's talking about, but all of these other people do. So obviously I can. And the things he's talking about aren't, you know, you've been touched by an angel. So now you can paint. These things are, you know, very practical disciplines that I can learn. And so the way that I actually met CW was during that, it was a one week workshop and all of the teachers um, came together. So there was like five workshops all happening in the same town. And then they would uh, meet together and there was a panel discussion with all the teachers one of the evenings, which was so amazing. I got to meet so many amazing artists in here. Um, their approach to painting, which I think was so important at the beginning, uh, for me especially, because they were all sitting there, and I remember specifically um, someone on the panel saying, the only difference between me and you, I'm up here on this podium, the only difference between us is I've painted more paintings than you have. Hmm. So I have had the mileage, I've put in the work, so I am up here, you know, sharing with you, and I'm, you have things to share with me, but you can be up here doing this just with mileage it's it's just putting in the work and they just kept saying hard work hard work hard work and i was like i was like the little energizer bunny just getting like even more powered up that whole time because i was just so excited i was just, i was my ego was crushed but then my desire was just supercharged because i thought that well if that's true and these people are painting these paintings that make me want to cry and rejoice and paint, I can do that too. And they're, they're giving me the tools. So I think with that, that starting ground, um, going into uh, my education, uh, which is forever, but those first couple years of just intense workshop taking, um, and like going to events such as Portrait Society, I, just had this fuel, you know, you are the people, you the faculty artists or you the workshop instructor, you have information that I really need. And how do I just convey to you how eager I am for it? Because in these workshops, you know, everyone is 40 years old or, or older, usually, you know, that's, that's the median age of workshop takers for various reasons. And then I was in there as, you know, a 17, 18 year old, 19. And there I, I, I was, I got attention for being so young, but then also I was very concerned that I would just get dismissed for being so young. And I remember distinctly like gearing for up for the, every workshop I would be in, like every single day I would feel sick and nervous and you know, excited and all anxious. And I would literally prepare mentally and just think, okay, how can I show them without being the person that takes the instructor's attention the whole time? You know, how can I show them that I'm so serious about this? And I think it was partly just natural because I was so serious about it. You know, I didn't have to try, but um, I mean, like fake it to be, to mm -hmm. feel, you know, um, you know, to be direct with people. But I remember with um, Johanna Harmon, when I was in her workshop, she had packed a lunch and I knew she had packed a lunch and I hadn't that day. And turns out I found out she would pack a lunch every day. 
So I packed a lunch the next day and I just, you know, oh, Johanna, you're packing a lunch. <laughs> Oh, and you're I, good. I was like, well, can I be with you? And <laughs> so then I was like able to sit with her and, you know, I was like, I, I need the information that you have, you know? And so, yeah, that's anyway, what I'm talking so about. It's that part of your personality. That's what I'm talking about. That has that, that has to have been a huge benefit to you. I I'm very thankful. I'm really thankful that my personality changed because as a young child, I was cripplingly shy and I don't know where it changed, but it did. And I'm really grateful. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You know, it's funny. You should say that. Cause I was the exact same way. And I always blame it on testosterone. I'm like, it must've been something about puberty, <laughs> <laughs> but I have no idea, That's but weird. I did a total 180 at some point in my life too. So I can relate. Um, yeah, That's that, awesome. yeah, I'm, yeah, I admire you for that, for your, and you know, when you came to me this last uh, Porch Society and you were so hungry for something that I had taught during one of my presentations and I, and yeah. you were the only one who came up to me after and was just like, tell me more about this thing. <clears throat> the only one out of how many people were there, like 500 people or something. And um, it just goes to what I'm saying is that you have this thirst, but you also have this directness that is really admirable. Thank you. I really appreciate that. That's really kind of you. So I still don't totally understand what you're teaching me, but I think I'm getting it more and more. <laughs> we'll talk. We'll talk some more. I'm not sure I totally understand anything I teach you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I think I do. Um, so, okay. So <clears throat> you also have kind of developed a look about your work and um but but you've gone to a lot of different workshops and i'm assuming there's some diversity and diversity in styles and in approaches and both in painting and drawing among all these different workshops so how did you balance all of that maybe not conflicting information but let's say like parallel information where it's not exactly on the same line but it you know what I mean? It's not exactly the same thing. How did you put those all together and create Stephanie? Well, I appreciate you saying, first of all, that you think I do. Um, that is interesting because I don't necessarily see that, which I think is something that you hear from artists a lot. But um, this, again, going back to that first workshop I took, this topic was addressed and I've never forgotten it. The panel of instructors who were huge people, you know, it was CW Mundy, Kwong Ho, Dan Gerhardt's. Um, there's two more up there. I think Laura Robb was one and I'm forgetting someone. So I'm really sorry to that person. Um, but you, you understand, like, it was like these people, the, the greats. And so anyway, they were up there and they were saying, you know, a question that was being asked, how do you develop your style? And every single one of them said, by not caring about your style, you just mm -hmm. are trying to increase always in your understanding of value, design, edge, shape, you know, all of these things. It's, it's not about a style. It's about um, the fundamentals, just constantly increasing in knowledge in those and as you focus not on your style but just on creating great art your style will come out and it only can come out through time and trial and error so that really stuck in my brain and that's been something that um i've obviously never forgotten and i've tried to keep in mind because it can be uh very confusing to synthesize all this information from differing viewpoints, especially when, you know, you talk to one artist and they say, oh, this brand of brushes, um, super high quality brushes is absolutely essential for creating art. Unless you have this, you can't create good art. You didn't and actually then you talk hear to that, did you? Else. You didn't yes. actually hear that. You actually heard someone say that. Really? Yeah. Okay. And then I talked to someone else and, you know, I was talking to them about their brushes and they said, oh, well, I just go to Hobby Lobby and I buy all the brushes they have when they're on a dollar sale and I stock up for the year and then I don't wash them out very well. And then I, that's when they're really how I want them, when they're really beaten up mm -hmm. and I, you don't need to have expensive tools. And so, you know, then you're, I'm sitting there like I have, wait, I have whiplash. So do I need expensive stuff or do I need not expensive stuff? 
<laughs> and so in some ways that has been um, helpful to me to have all the different opinions as opposed to um, studying under one person for four years or however long, though there have been times that I really wish that that could have been um, my reality um, to do that just for the continuity of, you know, just constantly having input. Um, I think I can never say what was better or what was not better, you know, but yeah. in my looking back, being able to hear all of these different approaches, you know, whether it's about the materials or it's about how you start or it's about um, how you think about painting, how it differs so much. The, even though there's great differences between, you know, what people do in their working techniques, the fundamentals are still the same. You know, value is still, value and drawing are still the fundamental um, backbone to all great art, whether it's realistic or not even. You know, when I realized that, I thought, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> so these things bridge all types of art. And the type of tool that you use, that's just something that I need to discover for myself. So, you know, that realization kind of came along after sitting through so many demos or not sitting through, but enjoying so many demos and hearing so many questions be asked by fellow students. I started I started to realize the question that people ask so often, you know, you're sitting in a demo and a student raises their hand and says, what color did you? Oh, my gosh, I can't believe you said beard? that. I was literally thinking that when you said what color, <laughs> the question that's asked so often, I'm like, yeah, like what color are you mixing right now? <laughs> And then you said and that. And I started to realize that that is, a, that is a question that cannot be answered because mm -hmm. unless you know every single color that they've mixed up until that point, you can mix the exact same color. It doesn't matter. It won't look the same on your painting. You need to find your color relationships, you know? And so. Well, not to mention that, that every, every color, it's the same answer. It's red, yellow, and blue. Like Right. <laughs> They're like, what colors did you put in that? And I always, sometimes I just, in frustration, go red, yellow, and blue. Red, yellow, and blue. <laughs> it's always red, yellow, and blue. Stop asking me the question. It's red, yellow, and blue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that makes, that's a, that's a really good answer. <laughs> to finish that thought, every time that I have tried to paint a great painting for a show or for a great style that I want to achieve or, um, you know, to be trendy or whatever. And those paintings have never ever worked. They fail miserably. And every single time that I have painted something because I either can't help but paint it, even though it doesn't make necessarily any sense, or because I'm so intrigued by the effect of light or the color harmony or just the person's face or what have you, something visual, you know, there's a visual element that I'm trying to achieve rather than some strange, ethereal, intellectual, trying to be trendy kind of goal. Um, those paintings have turned out to be some of my greatest paintings. So that I think is sort of the long winded answer of how um, whatever style you are noticing in my body of work has come to be. When I try to go out and, you know, I'm a planner paint something that's really, you know, just a great painting that never turns out. But when I go out and I see, you know, oh, there's this attic scene and I'm enamored with the light coming underneath the Chinese shade that's for some reason leaning up against the rafter. That is the effect that I'm trying to achieve. You know, then it's a painting that I love. So at what point did you discover that? I mean, so, cause I get questions like that color question all the time and it's understandable cause everyone wants to figure out as quickly as possible how to become a great painter. Right? So they're going to ask what seems obvious, but when, at what point did you figure out and why did you, how did you figure this out that the most important thing besides what they told you, because the reality is we hear things all the time and it goes in one ear and out the other. So you, my feeling is we all have to kind of find out that these things are right for ourselves, right? Yeah. So at what point did you realize that there is no formula um, to painting? Style only comes when you just let it let go and just search after principles. 
when did you figure those two things out? It was January 10th. No, I'm just no, kidding. I was like, um, what? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were serious. I was like, oh man, I was going to be so impressed. <laughs> You're all bigger. <laughs> no, um, there wasn't a particular moment. The really, the reality is that I fight against the desire to have a style and to, you know, have a formula every single time I come to paint. So it's something that I'm constantly learning and preaching to myself. I'm uh, trying to do that because I fall into the trap constantly, personally, of, you know, just being anxious about what's my style, Ugh, all this just stuff. But when I painted a painting called Main Man, um, I had just, it was a painting i painted it in november i believe mm -hmm. and i had spent all summer painting in maine this painting um is from maine um and it was a wonderful experience i had entered multiple shows and i had one best of show in two of the shows i had entered and then got into um another my first international show at a very low level but it was recognized and so you know, I had this feeling, you know, I am a professional painter and it didn't feel quite like I thought, you know, it should feel like um, that I just knew how to solve every problem. That's what I thought would happen. You know, by the time that I get into some show or the other, you know, I will just it won't be hard anymore to paint because I'll just have figured it out. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'll be professional. And that um, didn't happen. And I had all this personal pressure that I needed to just effortlessly roll paintings out of my studio, you know. And so I was trying and trying and trying to paint a painting that would be sort of a monumental work. And I had all of these ideas of and so many studies, I mean, a whole summer full of landscapes and portraits that I had painted that could be amazing paintings. And I was just ruining painting after painting after painting, trying to be monumental, trying to be professional, trying to be me, you know, trying to be Stephanie Page Thompson without knowing what that is or, you know, having any basis in reality and so i was all torn up because i wanted to enter portrait society and i wanted to have a monumental painting for it and um didn't have one couldn't paint anything worth anything even things that i should have been able to you know and i had no joy and i just knew that that wasn't right <laughs> to be so tortured by this you know painting is hard but painting is not this hard and so I was able to receive great counsel from my my mother and also several artist friends who just counseled me and said, just let it go. If your joy thing is gone, you need to just let it go. Oh, you don't need to enter this show this year. This is this is not what it's about. So you just need to paint. You don't need to worry about entering Fort Society or entering any shows. You did great last year, but that doesn't apply greater pressure to you this year. You you were great last year and now there's different things ahead for you this year, you know? So anyway, so I let that go that I was just not going to enter Fort Society. It was Portrait Society particularly um that was just I had made into this demon that was haunting me. And I started this painting, Main Man, and it was very large and one of the largest I'd done, not the largest, but I painted it in a really record time for me, which was about three weeks. And I just the whole time, you know, I was taking notes at the end of the day for what I had done well and what I needed to change the next day. And then I would come in the next day and I would look at the notes and I would change the things that I had said I needed to change and keep working and then do the same thing at the end of the day and i would make sure i always had enough paint on my palette so i was never getting to that point where you're scratching and you're just scrounging you know i i i instilled everything that you know you should do air quotes um as an artist you know i took many studies i was constantly taking pictures and putting it into black and white so i was only focused on value the whole time you know i was i was just the whole time thinking principles 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 and in the end 
it was a painting that I not only loved making for the most part, there's always pain points, but it was a painting that I didn't know I could make. And I was so excited, you know, and it wasn't because I had set out to paint, oh, I'm going to paint this portrait that is going to be called main man or, you know, I knew what I wanted it to look like, but I just knew that I wanted to capture this effect. And I knew anyway, so I was chasing the principles and not um, the idea of future glory, which is what I've been chasing before. You know, I wanted I was I was trying to paint for glory for myself so that I could get into a show that I wanted to boost my ego. So anyway, that's kind of um, hmm. that's a very raw or, you know, that's not a flattering image of myself. You know, that's just true, though. That's what I was doing. And then but we all go through that to. We all go through that. In fact, right. as you're talking, I'm like, oh, I need to think more about principles. I need to think more about principles. I mean, I don't think, I don't, it's kind of like a disease that you only keep under control. You never cure it. That's, yeah, that's, that's sort of how it feels. Yeah. And then, you know, it's one thing you mentioned about you were chasing fame and recognition and not the principles. When I, in, I interviewed, I mentioned this before, but I interviewed Joe Paquette before you. Are you familiar with his work? He is amazing. Yeah, he's unbelievable, and he's incredibly intelligent. But he called that um, the internal versus the external. He said, you, you never as an artist want to chase the external, which are external gratifications, like fame and money, even style, like a, a, as perceived by other people, but the internal. What do you love? What do you care about? What matters to you? Yes. Yeah, and that sounds like exactly what you're saying. Yes. It, yes, it's just a uh, very much better put way of saying what I just was trying to say. Yeah, well, I'm only quoting <laughs> Joe Paquette, so I couldn't come up with that myself. Yeah, yeah. It's just so fascinating to fight that in myself because I do think that it is important as artists to have recognition to boost you forward. You know, I've never forgotten the helpful critiques I've received and along the way, you know, at different points, someone even just saying, you know, when I'm totally just buried under this feeling of I'm never going to understand color temperature, or whatever, and someone comes along and says, you know, hey, yeah, you don't know color temperature, but you've got really good values in this painting, you know, like even just small little snippets of encouragement, and then even big snippets of encouragement of, you know, getting into a big show or something. I think that, that is so important, but I've learned for myself that that can't be my driving factor. And it's in, it's in like the little, the little moments, which is such a, you know, kind of ethereal thing to say, but you know, um, I read a book recently that said, you know, most of our lives are Tuesdays, you know, Tuesday is not the beginning of the week. So you don't have things that you do to kick off the week and it's not the end of the week. So you don't do anything exciting that you're, you know, it's like, it's Friday, we're going to celebrate or whatever. Tuesday is just this middle of the road day where, you know, nothing exciting is planned on a Tuesday, but most of our lives are these Tuesdays, you know, we go on epic adventures and we win epic awards or whatever, but most of our lives is a, just a Tuesday. And that's a good thing. And when I'm, you know, leaning into just this, like the, the little joys of, you know, like the Tuesday-ish parts of painting that I just want to paint this light effect on this one piece, or I love this barn, so I'm going to go paint it as many times as I can because I just love this barn and I want to capture it. That's where um, I work the best from and create my best work also, which then... That's the irony, right? Coincidentally, <laughs> leads to the parts that then are the big things or just the things that let you do it as a career. Right. Yeah, that's the irony. You chase your career and you'll you you're probably more likely to fail. But if you just <laughs> just chase your love for painting, then you'll do paintings that actually in move people. Right. OK, so let's move off that topic for a minute. I've got another question for you uh, just about your career in general. So how have you gone from a student to a professional and what has that process been like? That's interesting. That's a good question. Um, 
So the first four-ish years that I was painting, I was taking workshops at an average about three a year. Mm -hmm. And um, my parents had spoken with me right when I graduated high school and said, you're only 17, many people your age take a gap year and we're going to kind of count this as a gap year for you to see if this is something that you really want to do or if this is just something that you think you want to do and you don't actually want to spend your whole life pursuing. Mm -hmm. So, and that's, so we think that this year would be a good time to, um, to explore that. And so the end of that year came and it was very evident that I would continue for my whole life, um, Lord willing, pursuing an art, a life in art. So um, that year I had gone to Port Society for the first time. And I remember sitting in the, the big hall and there's people demonstrating, you know, and it's just this, this high of art and creativity. And mom leaned across to me at some point and said, what do you think? You know, and mm -hmm. I looked back at her and I said, I, that's going to be me. I want to be doing that. I want to be there. And so you can take that as like, also, there's a little bit of pride in that. I wanted to be like, but really in that moment, it was like, I want to be good enough that they asked me to come and be demoing, you know, mm -hmm. and as I continued on, I realized that my ego was also wrapped up in there of like, I want to be like everyone telling me I'm not good, you know? <laughs> and I am, um, you know, the Lord helps me with that. But um, <laughs> so, so anyway, so I knew that that was going to, what I really wanted to do. And mom was like, Oh, okay. Yeah. You, this is real for you. So those first four years, it was sort of like a college um, education. And mom, my parents said, you know, if you were in college to be a nurse, I wouldn't be expecting you to be making money as a nurse through college. So you are studying to be a painter. You don't need to make a living as a painter through college. That's not the goal. We want you to paint and paint and paint and paint and paint as much as you can, as well as you can and st study, study, study. And, you know, trust that that will grow into a career. And what was interesting was, which I thought was good advice. Yeah. And I was thankful for the opportunity to be able to do that. And what ended up happening was, you know, as I painted and I entered shows and I sold paintings and I received commissions and things, you know, it was, it started leveling out. Um, so... At this stage in my professional career, I would say that one of the big turning points was um, in 2019 when I painted several large pieces, some of my biggest or, you know, just most, the word monumental is coming to mind, which is a little um, dramatic, but they were very large and they were, you know, some of the most finished pieces that were kind of only possible because of all the work I had been putting in for so long. And okay. they were acknowledged and are these pieces on your website? Shooting. They are. So one is the painting of my friend, John, the man in the green coat with his hand up. It's right next to the boat. It's just two to the right. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right there. The man in the green Richard coat. John. John Henry Hans, like top middle. Like ah, all the way this one the right top. here. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful. So that one. That one went to a show here in Indiana, and it actually also Oops. received an award from Park Society. And so that received Best of Show. And then a portrait I did of a woman named Ingrid. It's just so happens to be a woman in a coat. I don't know what the deal was with coats. I have multiple <laughs> of Ingrid. I think it's going to be to the right, like if you toggle the other way. Um, it's going to be... it's. That's another painting I did of her, but not the painting. Okay. I painted her a couple of times. Oh, uh, that one. Beautiful. So that one is the largest painting I think I've ever done. So anyway, and that received also best of show that summer. And, um, and then that winter I was able to paint main man and that, that then did get into the porch society as a finalist. Of course it was the year that it, none of it happened, which is a bummer, oh, but that's no. okay. During COVID. But 
Yeah. <laughs> but it's, anyway, so that kind of is the difference. So, um, so now I'm able to paint full time and, um, I'm actually kind of looking for gallery representation or figuring out what that will look like for me in my career um, as social media changes constantly and everything. So there's right now my work can all be found um, through shows and through uh, my website. Okay. So that's your main avenue for selling work is through your website and the, and the yep. occasional show. Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And is that, has that been pretty successful, the website for selling it, paintings? It has, it has, um, with social media changing, like I said, you know, it's, it's Instagram is not about pictures anymore. It's about videos. So that's been interesting for me. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to, um, you know, that, that towing the line of just thinking about only about painting, but then also thinking about, well, how do I get these paintings to people, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, that's a, that's a ongoing discussion that I have. So let's look at more of your work then. Um, I'm going to pull up a few that are my favorites. And um, I want you to maybe just comment a little bit on those if you don't mind. Um, I, I don't really mind. love, well, I want to talk about your watercolors, but I really love your plain air work. This one is one of my favorites. And you know what I love about it? is it's so structurally solid and so well drawn and yet the brush strokes seem loose and effortless and as a painter i know that's really difficult to do so that's what it is and it's also beautifully designed um thank you yeah so is this a plain air painting was it done actually on location it is okay. yes okay this was done entirely on location this is actually a house I lived in, in Maine, and um, for just a summer, and it is falling apart. They're actually restoring it now, but it's this huge old house. Um, it was built in the 1840s, I think, mm -hmm. and it's quite old. And so this was the front porch, and I spent a lot of time on that front porch, and um, it was kind of a day when I didn't know totally what I should paint and I came out and saw this view and I set up to paint and this is so fascinating because this painting I almost scraped off and just abandoned because I was very frustrated because um, there's just so much white, you know, mm -hmm. air quotes again. And I was having a hard time creating the color temperature the color temperature relationships that I that were necessary and I just kept pushing through and just mentally thinking no this is you can figure this out and I'm just so glad I did because I love this painting now and um so yes so it was interesting you know there's oftentimes the desire for artists is to just become less tight they say you know and more painterly or whatever and my problem, I feel, or not problem, whatever, has always been that I need to actually kind of rein in the painterliness <laughs> because it can get super out of control. Um, and I just sometimes need to be more tight. But this painting, um, it did happen to work out that the, the bold brush strokes also were all happening to be in pretty much the right spot for it to look appropriate. Yeah. You know, what's really fun about this painting is you've got the air conditioner because <laughs> at least I think that's what that is. Is that an air conditioner right there? Yep. Because it's yeah. this old house that could have been painted 200 years ago or 150 years ago. <laughs> and then there's an air conditioner. <laughs> Just bring it, bring it to today. I never thought about that. Yeah. Um, so funny. Well, let's go from that house to, I believe this is a watercolor. I love your watercolors. Yeah. There, do you, you do many? Oh, that's oil. But let me go over to some of your others. Um, is this something that you've just recently started? Because you don't have a lot of them on your website. I don't have a lot of them on my website because I feel like it's really confusing for people. Um, it's interesting. My watercolors have never really been that successful. Um, just people just selling them. That barn painting, I've 
had um, in a show, the one that you actually showed first, but okay, um, this it, one. And no, that's a bridge. The barn paint. Oh, the one way back there. Okay, the, the one way back. Yeah. Um, and it was, and this is not why I don't. Well, maybe it is. So maybe this is showing me that I need to stop caring about what other people think about this. But it was in a show and people just constantly kept coming up and being like, yeah, that's beautiful. But it's just like, I don't know if it was in oil, like it would be more like it was you or, you know, it's just, I don't, you know, like all these things. Like it was like, it wasn't legitimate because I don't do a lot of watercolors or something, you know? Mm. So I just sort of thought, okay, well, then maybe I'll just... I'll just keep watercolor as a private thing. And that's what it has always been. You know, it's been just something that's exploratory for me because I don't know. And it's, it's more fun in some ways than oils sometimes are because, you know, the more you learn about something, the more you learn how much you don't know. Yeah. And I feel like I don't know more. I don't know more about oils. Okay. Now, how am I trying to say this? The more I learn about oils, the more I realize how much I don't know at this point i feel like i don't know anything about them so um in <laughs> yeah. watercolor i don't know what i don't know so i just try things and hmm. um i do i can't have that spirit with oils also you know i wouldn't paint anymore if i didn't have a, that spirit but it's just less pressure in some ways yeah. so um this one i actually painted from life with a friend and then I came back just a little while later and painted the oil that on that little toggle screen at the bottom. It's just two to the left. This one here. Um, it's the, the exact same view, yeah, just in that's oil. Beautiful. Thank you. So I, I mostly do oil when I, I mean, watercolor for myself. So a lot of the pieces that you see on here are just in my sketchbooks. And that's also a reason why they've not really been made for sale because they're all in sketchbooks. Mm. Right. Well, they're gorgeous. Well, let me pull up a couple others that I like. I really, well, this one is one of my favorites right here. I really like this one. And where was Thank this you. painted? Thank you. This was also in Maine. Um, this was the um, attic above um, an ice cream shop. So this is a quick story. I mean, I know we're supposed to be talking about art, but this is sort of like a little detour, but I grew up in Indiana and then I moved to Maine in the summer of 2019, partially just because I could. I had a falconer friend there who lives on the southern coast of Maine and has an ice cream shop. And um, they, they, he and his wife had this big old house next to the ice cream shop that I could live in. And then I could work part time scooping ice cream and then I could paint the rest of the time. So this falconer friend is also an artist. So they gave me like this awesome schedule for scooping ice cream. So I could paint all day long and then I would work from roughly 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. Um, five nights a week in the ice cream shop. And so I knew one person and I, in the whole state of Maine, this opportunity was presented and I would live there for, from May until September, the whole, the whole season. And I said, yes, that's, I want to do that. So I moved to Maine for that summer and it really kind of just changed my life. I happened to also meet my husband that summer and now we are married and that's the best thing that's ever happened to me. So um, anyway, all of this stuff. So the house with the air conditioner, you know, that was the house I lived in in Maine. And this is the attic above the ice cream shop where I worked in the evenings so that, you know, in case I didn't sell any paintings, I could still live. And um, that worked out. And so anyway, so this is the view of just wow. this old attic with this remnants up there. Wow. And, and it's sold. That's kind of a shame because it's got to be a little <laughs> sentimental in the house too. Because since you met yeah. your husband there. Yep. Wow. Those two paintings are in the same collection though. So they're, they get to be together. Oh, which that's is good. Nice. That's good. That was my <laughs> next question. Are they together? Cause that's what's important. <laughs> so, do you have that with your paintings, Jeff? Do you get sad? Like when you have to let certain ones go or do you just not let them go? No, they're occasionally I do, but most of the time, cause my paintings are usually quite large and they take a long time. So by the time I yes. let go of a painting, I just want it out of my life. And it's like a blessing yes. to get rid of it. Um, yes. It's sort of sad. But then when I see it later, it's like, a, it's like I'm being reunited 
with it. And it's like, oh, now I love you because you've been gone for so long, you know? <laughs> Um, like a newborn, like you forget all the sleepless nights and you're like, oh, you were so cute. Exactly. It's just like that. Actually, you only remember the good stuff. No. Yeah. <laughs> so no, usually I don't. But when I do small paintings, um, you know, anything smaller than, say, 24 by 30. Yeah, those are the ones that are harder to get let go of because they were so fast and you don't have time to hate them. But yep. yeah, it's just a little into my Amazing. crazy psyche. Um, so this is another one that I really love. Where was this one done? This, this is, I'm going to sound like a broken record here, Maine? but this was in Maine. Okay. And this is the, so right on the other side, like that beam that you can kind of see in the window mm -hmm. is the attic, the painting that we were just looking at oh, is right inside. Great. And that one's also so sold, but as long as yes, it's with the awesome. other two, I'm okay with that. Is it with the other two? That one's not. That <laughs> That's one's a darn not. shame. It's all by itself. Yep. It's all by itself. This one is also beautiful. And there's two that are, they Thank look you. like they might be the same place. Yes. They are. All of these, all of these paintings, um, excepting one, are all of the same barn. Okay. That no longer exists. So this barn stood right across from my childhood home. And when my husband and I moved back, um, when we left Boston, we moved just five minutes from my childhood home. Um, so I, I have spent this spring painting this barn before it gets torn down. And now it is torn down. Um, so this place no longer exists, which I'm really thankful for the chance that I got. It makes me sad, but I'm thankful I got to paint it when I did. So. So yes, all of these paintings, excepting one, um, are all of that same barn. Wow. Yeah. And they're all they're plein air paintings. Beautiful. And how often do you plein air paint versus working in your studio from photography or otherwise? Um, you know, that's interesting because I kind of go in spurts of uh, studio, 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 and then going plein air painting a lot. Um, I would say right now it's kind of a mixture because I've been balancing um, a commission and then um, this this desire to and pull to paint this barn before it gets torn down this spring. So I was spending more time in the studio and going about two days a week for at least four hours to paint um, the barn when I could, when it wasn't freezing this spring. So in my everyday working, I would say that I spend more time in the studio, but um, I, so I would say like 70, 30, probably. Hmm. Okay. What yeah. is your favorite? Do you no. prefer outside or do you prefer the studio? Um, you know, when I'm in the studio, I prefer outside. And when I'm outside, <laughs> I prefer in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just That's kidding. Funny. But you know, the grass is always greener. Yeah. And so it's like, I'll be having a really hard time plan uh, planner painting. And I'm like, Oh, man, I should just know that I'm just a studio painter. I keep trying to be this planner painter, but I'm just not and then, you know, in the studio, you think, so I think that each has their um, benefits when I notice when I'm in the studio, and I'm not thinking in principles and i'm thinking you know um i have all the time in the world with a photo and all of my paintings are starting to get more and more um lifeless um because that's what seems to happen to my paintings when i just am working from a computer screen i go and i try when i can then to just balance and go plein air painting and get the feeling again of you know the light is changing you know and you have to make those fast decisions and um and get that pep in my step again. So then bring that back into the studio, you know, and treat my photos like they're not a photo, if right, that makes sense. Right. Yeah. And see, kind of see so, how I love how, you can how, see a hair. What's that? I said, I love how you can see a hair on this painting. <laughs> you can. Oh, yeah, you can right there. How about that? I that hair that probably just drove the price up like 50%. That's probably yeah, exactly. probably a, a lint from piece of lint from your studio, which it should drive up the value. Yes. <laughs> All right, let me see. This one is one that you recently posted that I find really interesting, and it reminds me of uh, oh, now I'm drawing a blank. Vermeer. 
Oh, wow. It reminds me you. of the Vermeer painting. Yeah, because he always had that. He did so many paintings with that big north window and a figure. Yeah. Was that, it, it, is, was that so inspired in by that or is that just a coincidence? I would have to say that that is just a coincidence. And now that you say that, I completely see the similarity. But this, that was, that was a completely a coincidence. Hmm. Um, and I'm, it's a happy coincidence because Vermeer is incredible. Yeah. So this painting, it's something that I've been really trying to figure out in my own work and experiment with is becoming more narrative in my work. And I admire you for this greatly. I mean, it seems like one of your superpowers um, oh, to just be able to tell this amazing story in your paintings. And that's always something that I feel I, I'm not um, able to do, you know, like I started out just trying to get a likeness and then I could get a likeness and then I wanted to move towards getting, you know, better color harmony and value. And then, you know, so like I've progressed along and now I feel like, okay, I have these skills and now I want to use them to tell a story or, you know, go beyond just the man sitting in the chair holding the glasses. I mean, there's a story implied, but it's very static and right. I want to move further than that. So this is my, this I feel like is my first attempt and somewhat successful attempt. So if I can just walk through a tiny bit, you know, yeah. this woman is named Marcy and she's also in Maine. And um, she, the ice cream shop that I lived in and worked at um, in the evenings, they make homemade waffle cones and that's sort of what they're known for. And they run out, you know, people that come at 530 probably won't get them because they sold out or like in, you know, sometimes they sell out in the middle of the afternoon and then you're just out of luck. You're not going to get one. So it's this it's this thing. And so she Marcy is the chief waffle cone maker and she comes and makes waffle cones like about 400 at a time, um, multiple mm. days a week for the ice cream shop. And so I she would come to the to the house where I lived. So because I lived adjacent to the shop and where she would make the waffle cones was right outside of my kitchen. Um, I would just get up in the morning straight out of bed and paint her while she was making these cones. She would come around 7 a.m. And so I set up my easel right in this doorway. Um, I actually on my Instagram have uh, several videos of the process of painting this painting. No um, and you just, and it shows the um, the setup that I was in. So this doorway you can see to the left um, with the handle is the doorway, which immediately leads down about seven steps to a, to a cellar, to the exterior um, entrance to this to this area. And so I had my easel set up on these chairs, you know, and I was painting on I mean on these stairs, and I was painting on these stairs through this doorway of her. And so, um, like I said, on Instagram, you can see the painting that I did from life. That was a color study for this work. Um, hmm. and so, so I painted her from life over multiple sessions, doing multiple different, you know, gouache studies, drawings, and an oil painting that was ultimately the study for this. And I wanted to try to just, you know, tell this, tell a story more than just her making waffle cones. And I wanted her to kind of feel surprised and, make it feel like you were kind of barging in on her, which after the fact, I thought, you know, that's not, she's so friendly that it's not really true to her nature to really kind of look at you with this, you know, to be, it, it, I don't want her to feel angry that you're coming in, but I wanted there to be this feeling of, oh, you've, you've kind of interrupted me during this serious business of making waffle cones. And so I included that little piece of the door to sort of hint at the, doorway and purposefully uh tilted some of the the table on which she is making these cones where the waffle cone maker is to kind of create a little imbalance and you know these are the things that were going on in my head and as the viewer and someone as the master of design you may look at it and find totally different different aspects but that and then that, that smoke cloud that coming up behind her really the smoke doesn't get much higher than just right around the waffle maker but i loved when i painted it from life there was a couple times where it would go really high and i exaggerated that because i loved the drama of the smoke going so high and so i experimented with a couple different smoke shapes and i just sort of loved that wispy smoke 
cloud that was coming up behind her, kind of creating this provenance to her. So anyway, that's the story behind that painting a little bit. And um, I, I really experimented with texture on this one and, yeah. and left some parts very thin, which I felt was very daring. <laughs> yeah, it is. You got some extremely thin paint down here. And then, yeah, and then some really thick paint here. So thin here, thick here. And I love the color, the color combinations you chose. You've got these really warm, warm yellows and oranges with this juxtaposed, these really cool violets. That's pretty bold too, but it works. Well, yeah, it's you. beautiful. Um, so I'm curious you. about this one because of because you being a falconer is did I say that right? A falconer? Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Um. So yeah, tell me about this one. Is this one of is this your bird? Yes. So this was a bird that I had um, in a couple years ago. I think this one was actually Sargent. So after I've had something about six birds in my career as a falconer, because like we spoke about earlier, you, you train them, you trap them from the wild and then train them. And then you can keep them for however long you would like essentially. And I kept them for roughly two to three years each, um, some only one and uh, a couple years I had more than one. So that would let, equals out to about having six different birds um, didn't, during my career as a falconer. So this one was named Sargent and I started naming them after painters I love. <laughs> and I had this idea to sort of describe the legacy of falconry because even though in the United States it's quite unknown and unusual, um, it's been around for thousands of years and um, used to be in certain parts of the country uh, closely related to status. And um, so, you know, you would, there's literally lists that you can find um, showing what your social class was in old England um, and what bird you would have based on that class. So, like, the king would have an eagle or a peregrine falcon, and a peasant would have a kestrel, which is a very small, I do have a painting of a kestrel, I think somewhere on here, but maybe it's not on the website, unfortunately. It's a very, it's the smallest um, falcon. But the uh, fastest, right? Um, I think the peregrine falcon is the fastest. Oh, you're right, yeah, that's right. I don't, I, I don't think my kestrel painting is on here, unfortunately, oh, it but not? it is on my Instagram. <laughs> oh, this one's so beautiful you too, follow though. It on Thank you. That is the same bird. So this was a study I did for um, doing that larger piece. So I found this tapestry online that showed um, this, you know, this page boy with someone of, you know, it seems great high class with a bird on their arm and put that, you know, this was all pretend because I didn't actually have the tapestry. It's in some museum in England, but I put a cloth of similar coloring that I wanted behind and then put this um, tapestry sort of behind my bird, sort of hinting to the sport of kings that it is. It's what falconry has always been called. Oh. So, and then I painted my bird from life sitting on a, uh, on a perch just in my studio. Really? It just sat and there. I Yep. No so that hood that is on its head yeah. is a training technique. People often are, you know, you'll hear people say things like, oh, doesn't it hurt them? Is, it, is that bad for them? When they fit properly, it doesn't hurt the bird at all. It just keeps it very calm and it's a training technique. And I, it's interesting because in, like, in the Middle East, there's been this long history of instead of using hoods, they just so the bird's eyelids shut um, to achieve the same effect. Really? So the hoods are very humane. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Jeez. They're much better than that um, practice. So anyway, so with the hood on, the bird was just totally still. I mean, he would move around a good deal and then do this stretch, but he wasn't, you know, flying or anything. So right. I was able to paint him. Um, pretty much i think i painted this whole thing from life of him and then put the tapestry in the background 
Yeah, it's beautiful. I miss that. And the I these this hood is really interesting in and of itself. It's a cool feature. Nice focal point. Mm hmm. I love. I know that you are a big um, craftsman with you know leather and all, I mean basically anything. I want to come to you and learn how better to paint and then also to weld and everything because <laughs> I that would be such a useful tool. Uh, uh, skill but yes you can make those hoods yourself and i have i have only just made one in my career and it it's not huh. as beautiful what are they made of is it different. leather and brass it's leather and then you you can make the whole thing out of leather um but most of them are made from leather and then the the braces that you're they're called mm -hmm. that tighten and loosen i have one somewhere um, nowhere close by, but, um, those are usually of a synthetic material. And then the plume from the top is mostly decoration, but it's also how you remove and, uh, return the hood to the head. You grab it with your fingers. So, and that's usually, um, the, popularly it's made out of like a horse hair or, um, feathers or hmm. something like that. Yeah. That'd be fun to make something like that. That's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a place to put excellent. one, but <laughs> okay. Well, so tell me more about what you're thinking. Let's talk about what you plan on doing next. I mean, you're talking about how you have this desire to do narrative work. Do you have a vision for what your, the next five or 10 years looks like as far as your painting goes? I, I, I have a loose vision. Um, I've, I've had really tight visions about what I want the next couple of years to be, and that doesn't, that's not how it, life works. But um, yes, at this, at this stage, I feel like embarking on this narrative journey um, of trying to incorporate that more into my work, which, which is interesting. Actually, this painting behind me, um, if you can see it. I can it, see it. Yeah, let me sort switch of, here. That was the first painting I tried to do a narrative story. And then I found out after the fact, I thought, you know what? It's actually really not that narrative. It's just a guy sitting in a barn. But there's great technical elements to it. But And that sort of led me to work a little harder for that painting of Marcy making the waffle cones. You know, I need to actually, I need to really think about this. And that challenge is becoming really interesting to me. So there's, a, there's this series I would like to embark on um, that this painting right oh i'm in the mirror view this painting right here is sort of the star too and you probably can't see it very well um it's not on my site because it's not finished but that barn that i've been painting for the last several months um the man who's who grew up milking the cows in that barn and farming the land because his dad owned it um is a friend of mine and i was able to walk through the barn and take many photos of him before it was torn down. And I just want to tell this story of him in the barn in these different views and scenes. So anyway, so that's like a, that's like a next three month plan. Um, but as far as my career as a painter, I just, I, I feel so blessed to be able to paint. And there was a time when I was working Working, you know, so many different jobs or was still in school, I mean, high school, but, you know, and I couldn't paint more than a couple days a week for a couple hours. And I remember talking to these artists and, you know, specifically one saying to me, yeah, well, you know, my, I'm so blessed. My life really is all about painting. And I just remember th sitting there and, you know, I had all these babysitting jobs and nannying jobs that were making it possible for me to spend those days painting and to take workshops and all these things. And I just thought, wow, I, I would really love for that to be able to be my reality that I could make painting just such a huge part of my life. You know, I don't want it to be my entire life because that's not healthy um, for me, but it's, it's not my entire life, but I want it to be um, the pursuit that I can pursue mostly in my life. So I feel so grateful that I have for the most part been able to do that, um, this early in my life. So that's, that's what, aside from what do I particularly want to paint? I just, that's my goal is just to create 
art for the rest of my life, however that mm -hmm. may look. Um, and right now I'm, I'm just really excited to be painting Charlie in the barn. And next month, my husband and I are going to be able to go back to Maine for the month. Um, his family lives there and he's from there. So we're going to spend some time there and I can't wait to then paint. So, you know, plein air is going to be my favorite thing when, this August and then who knows what will come from that. So hopefully that's not a cop out answer, but it no. is just, you know, I I've, I found that my works, um, the paintings that have moved me most and have had the, you know, an impact on other people are influenced by just events and people in my life. And so I don't know, you know, I didn't know about what Main Man was going to do, meeting the model for Main Man, you know, that influenced my painting Main Man, which then influenced my career, you know, so hopefully as I continue and grow, um, I can just incorporate more of my life in my work. Um, that's, that is what moves me so much. So when I see painters who just are making art of their life, you know, I think that's why the Wyeths are so fascinating to people because they just painted their lives, you know? And so I, I want to just be so fascinated by my life and the beauty around me that I just am painting it. And so when I can look back, I'll see this diary, this visual diary of my life. That's, that's my goal. <laughs> I love it. Well, I found that with my career, I can't think more than four or five paintings into the future. Because when I do, yeah. when I do, I end up changing my mind by the time I get to painting five. So I, <laughs> I don't think that's a cop out at all. But the difference is my paintings take me about a year. So that's five years into the future. <laughs> so they take a long time. That's helpful to know, though, because some paintings of mine have taken quite long. And then I feel like they're not, you know, if it takes that long to figure it out, that must have been something wrong but that's not true no they can take a long time yeah i mean these are big paintings you know 10 13 feet tall but they take a long time yeah, yeah. but so my last question is um and i think you're a particularly good one to ask this question because you've been so successful so young and achieved so much what advice would you give to people who want to paint for a living that you need to just paint. Okay. Um, that's very simple. I, I suppose I would say you need to pray about it and you need to paint because I see a lot of people talking. I don't see this a lot, but you know, there is in all areas of life, we all want to do things, but unless you actually start doing it, um, you're never going to, start on the path. And unless you're painting and uh, painting for the joy of painting, um, you're not going to have anything to give to anyone. So um, I guess that's a little too high level. Um, the advice that I received, I think was invaluable um, about seeking out a teacher. So, hmm. um, and I've sought out many teachers. So, you, you need to be painting, you know, you can't just want to always be painting and never actually making it to the easel and not making anything. Um, if you want to do it for a living, which is fine. If you don't want to make a living, I think that's just as legitimate. But um, uh, for me, it was invaluable to have good teaching and I was able to just paint a lot. <laughs> No, that's, that's great advice. Put your money where your mouth is. If you want to be a painter, paint. I mean, I think right. that's great advice. And it's easy for people, myself included, to have big dreams, but to be either frightened or intimidated or whatever the emotion might be that can keep us from actually doing the thing that we dream about doing. So I, yes. I think it's great advice. I feel like I thought it would get less scary the more um, I painted, you know, every time starting a painting or even just getting it the next, you know, big idea for a painting. I'm always excited and then I'm always so scared because it feels like this huge endeavor, you know, I need, I want to bring it out to its fullest, but you just, you just got to keep going. Yeah, that's great advice. Stephanie, it's been such a pleasure to have you on the show. I really appreciate you having this conversation with me. Thank you so much, Jeff. I really appreciate it. It's a real honor. Thanks for tuning in to the Undraped Artist Podcast. If you enjoyed it, subscribe. 
And if you could, leave a comment or review. That really helps the channel. Please share the show with your friends, and if you're feeling generous, consider a monthly donation at theundrapedartist.com. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next week.